Okay, so we are going to be taking a look at Fahrenheit 451's Section 2 Analysis, The Sieve and the Sand. Let me try to move this over here out of the way. Okay, and as we talk about this today, you're going to see here we have Themes and Colors Key. And within each section that we talk about, you are going to see these, these themes where we where they're indicated that we can see them or that they relate as we go through each section so we're focusing only on in this in this video about section one so let's take a look um, we left off with we left off with montag at the end of section one he was he was going through and he was reading he pulled one of the books down he looked at the book he read it through I think it said about a dozen pages and then he read it through again. So that's where we're picking up. So here we are. The summary here says Montag and Mildred spend the afternoon flipping through books. Remember, Mildred doesn't understand what's going on. She doesn't think there's a point to this. She just wants to go back to her to her um, parlor family. Um, and it says that with her TV family, she's also very nervous because she's afraid that Montag is going to, you know, loses a job or somebody's going to find out but Montag is more worried about um, the de Mildred's depression Clarice's disappearance he hears the bombers flying overhead so he knows the war is going on he says their country has started and won two atomic wars since 1990 now remember this was written in the 50s so started and won but no one talks about the rest of the world and he doesn't know what's going on it's like he's waking up from this sleep that he's been in uh, and it's all because of Clarice he doesn't understand but he thinks that if he can find something in the books maybe that will help over here we have um, we have oh sorry we don't need this sorry um, I just wanted maybe a line or something here <laughs> Okay, this isn't working either. Um, okay, don't need that. Don't need the text here either. Okay, in his confusion and despair, Montag places his hopes in books. This is the first time that we see this. We see Montag thinking, okay, maybe I can find something. Information hasn't been given to me, so maybe I can find something. So he does have books stored. And Mildred is there. She's trying to read along, but she doesn't understand. And she's afraid of everything. And basically, this is telling us that she really does like the way her life is right now. Notice the active themes that we have here. If we go back to here, we have mass media, censorship, conformity versus individuality, distraction versus happiness, action and inaction. So look at all of them. You see all of these here in this first in this first chapter. I mean, this first section of her summary. So then this is where Montag remembers um, Faber, who was a retired English professor. He met him in a park and Faber in the beginning was a little bit afraid of Montag because Montag is a presence. He's the he's the symbol of the fireman. He's the symbol symbol of the establishment. He's the symbol of you know the the soldier and so montag talked to faber he assures him he's safe they talk a while faber feels secure enough to recite some poetry and this is the man that makes the impression on montag um we watched the modern version the 2018 version and this is where we have the character of clarice the new character of Clarice absorbing some of the characteristics of Faber because we don't see Faber in the 2018 version. And it, it is Clarice who wakes him up even more because here in the book, remember, Clarice disappears. We don't know what happened to her. Did she really get, get hit by her car? Was she taken out by the government? Did she just disappear? We don't know at this point. But we do know that Faber does have quite the impact on Montag. That he gives him his phone number, and that was a year ago. So now Montag decides he's going to call on Faber for help, and he asks on the on the phone, "How many copies exist of the Bible, Shakespeare, Plato?" Faber hadn't heard, has not heard from him, so he's he's a little concerned at this point. And you would be too if you think about it. He hears from this fireman out of the blue, and he asks him all these things. He thinks he's being set up. That's a logical assumption. Montag doesn't think 
he can get what he needs from the books because he doesn't have practice reading. He didn't study literature and it's difficult for him to read. So he want you know, he generally, most people focus on TV because books aren't there and they watch TV because the TV just pours into you what they want you to know. One, they give you one view, um, not unlike the TV we have today. We have television not only giving us news, but telling us what we need to know about it rather than giving you information and allowing you to make your own, make your own um, assumptions. Faber is conditioned by years of violently enforced censorship. So he's afraid. He's afraid to help. He thinks that Montag is part of this establishment or as we would call it today, um, the, you know, the, the military um, industrial complex which is very much what what Montag represents. So as we go on in this section, Montag shows Mildred the book he took from the old woman's house. Now remember, when the old woman wouldn't leave and she burned right there in front of him, it was a huge impact on Montag. It was that catalyst, that turning point, where he doesn't understand what is in those books that has such promise. What is in those books that makes it not worth makes her life not worth worth living so it was profound for him he make he has a deep he he, ha, he knows something deep is going on he's missing something and so this is what starts his journey this is what starts his not along with Clarice but maybe it um pushes him over a little bit so at the old woman's house it's a bible he doesn't know it could be the last Bible in existence. Mildred tells him to give it to Captain Beatty because remember, if it's really the last Bible, they want to get rid of it. They want to get rid of everything. But Montag wants to hand in a different book. But he realizes if Beatty knows that he took the Bible, it's going to make it clear that he has a book and that he had a different book. So he decides he'll have to get a replica of the Bible made. And like the old woman in the house, Montag is suddenly changing. His character is changing from a static character to a dynamic character. He's now willing to put himself in danger. He's willing to preserve a book. This is new. He's never done this, but he's taken a stance against society. Um, at this point, he is not, like this says, an outright rebellion, but he is trying to protect the Bible. And you might ask yourself why. Why is he trying so hard to protect this book? And I'm not so sure that it's just because it's the Bible. It's because it's a book, a book that was so important to this woman that she had. And he, he sees, he sees what she sacrificed herself. And like, as I said, he, he knows he's missing something. So he becomes, um, it may be his own quiet rebellion at this point, but Mildred, becomes agitated she yells at him he can't calm her down she says you're ruining them he wants she wants her life to go back she wants to be able to be in her home take her drugs watch her parlor friends and she even goes through the questions of um she tells him that her friends are coming over to watch um, a show called white clown okay that's kind of interesting when we think about clown does White Clown love her? Does her TV family love her? She knows it's a silly question. She is getting some sort of, that's where she's getting um, the, her needs met. She is feeling like these people are who need her um, and she needs them, not through Montag. The real relationship she doesn't even recognize. How much is that kind of like what's going on today in our society? People care so much about likes on social media and what people are saying and you know so another reason that cyberbullying has such a profound effect because we embrace deeply what people think about us on social media or rather some people embrace so mildred is kind of an embodiment of that very modern feeling of how people embrace people they don't know here it says that Mildred cannot maintain any feelings of anger for any length of time because she doesn't have depth of feeling. She doesn't feel anything and she just wants to move on to the next thing in life that excites her. And the only thing that excites her are these shows, which may be a reason that all of these, all of her suicide attempts and the number of suicide attempts that are so common 
in in this life. Uh, but Montag, Montag is different. He has changed. He's listening to questions. He he thinks Mildred is silly. He he wants to avoid her, and he gets on the subway. And remember, he has the book with him. And then he his mind flashes back to a time when he's a child at the beach, and he this goes to the title of the story when he's trying to fill a sieve which is like a colander something you might strain spaghetti with a bowl with lots of holes and he's trying to fill it with sand and no matter what you do when you try to fill something full that has a bowl with holes you're never going to get it filled because there's nothing to stop the sand and he realizes this he realize he thinks that he can keep some of the sand in the sieve and he does that if he can he thinks if he can read the text and hold on to the text it won't just disappear like the sand disappearing in the sieve he tries to read a passage he's too distracted he's not accustomed to reading the sand is falling through the sieve is a metaphor for the knowledge in society in general so think about that metaphor meaning something that stands for something else you have a bowl full of holes and the sieve is the knowledge that's falling out of the bowl and the bowl is society there's no way to stop the knowledge from falling through because everything has holes but what we see with montag and the change in montag is that he no longer accepts the basic values of his society so he's got to do something and until he can find some value to take the place of everything he's losing he's feeling desperate he's feeling lost He's got to find something to fill him up. Montag shows up at Faber's house. He's a little bit more reassured when he shows him the Bible and says, I'm here. I'm going to talk. I want to talk to you. Faber describes himself as a coward because he didn't speak up a long time ago when he saw the way society was changing. Because remember, society doesn't change instantaneously in a snap. It's not like a Thanos snap where people disappear and society changes. It changes over time slowly and usually as it slows people simply conform because they don't want to rock the boat things get things are too easy to just keep going go along to get, get to get along kind of thing so Faber recognizes he should have done something a long time ago but he didn't and then he asked Montag why did you even come we see that Faber believes in the books of knowledge he recognizes he's just a scholar he didn't have any any courage and he wishes he could do something but unlike Mildred who conforms because she's not able to pay attention Faber conforms out of fear now let's take a minute and just think and ask the questions we have two kinds of people people who are addicted to distraction do we have distraction going on in our world today we do I mean think about what's going on in Canada do we have something going on in Canada okay do we have something going on in the ukraine we have all of these distractions people are conforming because they're scared they're afraid of they've got distraction here and distraction here and what's going on and what might happen faber is like other people he is conforming out of fear what if i get in trouble what if i stand up and something is taken away just like in canada that you people that are standing up have, are having bank accounts frozen um the threat is they're going to come after them and just today we have that the Prime Minister of Canada or yesterday rather um, he actually um, we have martial law in Canada so you can ask yourself in your mind do you feel like Faber is a coward because he has fear but don't we all have fear we're all afraid I think the difference is recognizing that you have fear that you are afraid but your character is in what you do about it and maybe Faber recognizes the same thing even though he was fearful he could have acted and he didn't and he feels guilty he feels like this society he helped create because of his inaction Mildred on the other hand would never recognize that because she doesn't recognize number one there's anything wrong with society or that she has any responsibility and she's just she's just blank she just has no knowledge so while he's there with Faber Montag says something is missing from people's lives remember in this society you have only one choice you have only the party line they're giving you the information you want to know they take away anything that's going to make you unhappy they, they burn books because they don't want you to know knowledge because knowledge is power 
So this is what they do. They take all those things away. And Montag finally realizes that it's the books. The books are clearly what's missing. And maybe that's what, maybe that's the answer. But Faber responds, it's not the books that are missing, but it's what's in the books. It's the knowledge. And all of this could be on the radio. It could be on the television. But you have vast censorship. Hmm. Vast censorship. Does that sound familiar also? We have one idea. Anything that is against one idea, those things are not um, are, are not even shown on, on mainstream media today. So it's timely in talking about what is going on today and relating it to what's going on here. But Faber says it's not the books that are missing. It's what's in the books. It's the knowledge. It's the history that's been kept from us. It's the information that we should know. Now, pay attention to Faber's point. This is this is very important. Faber's point is that people have stopped searching for knowledge. Just like Mildred, who is clearly the example she doesn't want to know anything. She wants something that's easy to watch and digest and move on. She doesn't want to have to think and she can be happy. But we know if you ha she's got multiple suicide attempts, she is empty. She, there's nothing that has fulfilling her life. And she's not happy either. So you have a society of people and none of them are happy. The people that are recognizing the lack of knowledge are not, those are people aren't happy. The people that are embracing the society because they know no better they're not happy faber says three things are missing from people's lives so let's look at those the first it says is the quality information that has detailed and textured understanding of life as a parable this is where faber mentions the story of hercules and antaeus who was a giant wrestler who was invincible so long as he stood firmly on earth, as long as both of his feet were touching earth, he was invincible. But when Hercules defeated him because he lifted him off the ground, and that's you know a story of mythology, he agrees when Montag relays Mildred's contention that TV seems more real than books. But he responds that he prefers books because television is too fast and controlling. You can't stop watching or you'll miss what's happening. With books, you can put them down, consider them to digest, and say what you, you know, think about it, talk about it, maybe write about it. You have time to think about the meaning it has before you move on. I think that's probably true for us. Think about when we, when we talk, when we think about attention span, I know a lot of people prefer movies to books, but a lot of people, a lot of you said, um, I like the book better. I like the book better because of the depth that you you could take this book, you could read what information was there and you digested information that was important to you. I think it's the same for us today. While we do enjoy watching TV or TikTok or YouTube or whatever, whatever we're going to watch with social media because our attention span is very small. Books can be read and stopped and read and stopped and you can still gain a much um, deeper meaning of what they're trying to say here we have faber mentioning the parable of hercules and antaeus and notice the connection to mass media it's talk it, it, he's saying that mass media has lost its connection to real life by leaving out the thought and knowledge boom wow what do we talk about all the time it's the same story, no matter what where you what news network we put it on. Um, it's almost like a parroting of re repetition over and over of what you should know. Not only is it censorship that we are facing, it's almost like indoctrination of over and over and over the same kind of information being shown to us so much that it's boring. We, we, we don't even want to watch it. I mean, who, who even watches TV because you, we've gone past it. We recognize that. And this comment in turn, it proves no, it provides no strength to those who consume it. When you watch something from television, you don't have that connection, that meaning as we read through this book, there are those quotes that come out that come to us that speak to us 
and you think about it, you think, wow, there's something deep and profound and meaningful. I get it. I get that. And it resonates with me. I understand what that means and I can apply it. As we go over this text and, and we're talking today, that's exactly what we're saying. This resonates with us. These are active themes. And even though this was written all those years ago, we still have the same issues, the same problems. We have, it's almost like a prediction. It's almost like Bradbury hopped in a time machine, came forward and said, okay, this is what it's going to be like. Um, not exactly, but in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, um, he can see connections and we can make those connections. Faber believes that any form of media can contain information that information he prizes in books, but he thinks that the effort to require required to read real books makes them best suited, the best suited type of media for disseminating rich and complicated ideas. The media could give us, could report on things for us, could report on news and allow you to come to your own conclusion. I remember Walter Cronkite reporting on news. And, you know, he was a famous journalist at the time. And I don't ever remember that particular journalist from all those years ago giving you a point of view and saying, this is what is happening. Now, maybe that I was just way too young to catch on, but I remember him reporting this and you made a connection. You weren't told the connection. You made your own connection. And people thought about what the connections were. In the society we have here, there's no fighting because there's no there's no conflicting point of view. And what about that? Remember, it was because Faber, I'm sorry, Captain Beatty said, you don't want the people unhappy. Give them one point, of, give them, um, don't give them two points of view. Montag said, give them one. And Faber said, I'm sorry. Beatty said, better yet, give them none. Tell them what to think. Hmm. Kind of profound and deep and maybe like what we have to do, what, what we're talking about today okay so the second missing thing in people's lives is leisure time and leisure time doesn't mean hours spent speeding in cars or in front of four wheels four wall tv shows instead it means the leisure of silence and having the space in one's life to examine and digest one's own reading experience and i would go on to say um, connections with nature and connections outside and connections with people and humanity those things are important because as we came out of COVID, I think that's something that we really missed. We missed the isolation wreaked so havoc on our, on our world. Think about when schools closed and we were locked down. That was miserable for so many people, me included, all of us. I mean, maybe the first, you know, having some time in the beginning, but afterwards it, it was just too much. In Fahrenheit 451, there's plenty of leisure time, but think about the kind of leisure time. Even Clarice says people drive by, they don't even know, they see this, they, they see a blur of green and they know it's grass, but do they know what grass, grass looks like? It's like it's all surrounded by noise. You just, you have the noise of society. There's always the parlor families. There's always the media. Everybody's talk, 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 talking, but there's not quiet, quiet time to reflect on what you see and what you feel and what you've read. And I would say that that, that is significantly important in any society, ours as well, but yeah, it's significantly important. Okay, let's, um, uh, no, 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 that should have been 11. Okay. Okay, Faber's third requirement is the freedom for people to act based on what they've learned and what they and when they have to access both quality information and the peace of mind to think it through so think about think about what this means and this is one of the reasons that i hate Beatty so much the freedom of people to act on what they learn when they have to access when they, when they have access to both quality information and the peace of mind to think it through. See, Beatty has that. Beatty knows what's in the books. He has the peace of mind to act on whatever he wants, and he has power. And he uses his power like the Nazi brown coats by punishing other people who want that knowledge. And this, 
again, is a reminder of the physical violence that hovers over Faber and now Montag because he's decided to take, take a step back and be a knowledge seeker, be a truth seeker, find out what's going on and see if something fulfills him. So yeah, he's, he's part of that. Um, he's become part of what he's fought against the whole time. And at this point, I'm not sure if he understands just how deeply Beatty is involved. So Montag, being because he is a, a person of action, he, he's, he's got to do something. He wants to do something. Faber has always been fearful. Has never, he has known this the whole time. He's always been afraid to, to act. Montag is just awakened. So he has to, he wants to act. Faber hypothetically suggests the scheme of printing books and planting them in the firehouse to discredit the firemen. Montag jumps at the idea, but as the bomber flies overhead, because remember you have another war, Faber says that the firemen are actually just a symptom because the populace doesn't want to read anyway. And that's pretty profound. How do you change a society that doesn't want to change? How do you change a society that's happy the way they are? And, and you could think about that even relating to our society today. I read an article yesterday and it gave the percentage of people who did not want to end mass mandates and did not want to end COVID lockdowns. They wanted to stay. They didn't want anything to change. They just wanted everything to stay the same. Now, it was a very small percentage, but the fact that you have the percentage, if it's a large per percentage, how do you change a society that doesn't want to change? Even though they don't know there's another way. Faber says they'd be better off just waiting for the coming war to destroy the current civilization. So Faber is kind of what's known as a fatalist. He figures, and you might want to write that down, fatalist. He doesn't see any way out. He's not strong enough to make any changes on his own. He hates the way things are, but he's not going to risk anything to change it. Montag is a man of action, so Montag is probably going to do something. The weight of seeing civilization decay and his feelings of cowardice have left Faber unwilling to act. But this is Faber's character. He is knowledgeable, but he's never had a strength of character to act out and do anything about it. He, he can't f face risking anything for what seems like a losing cause, which this part makes me totally have zero respect for Faber. He knows what's in those books. And although he values the books and he has knowledge of the books, he is not w strong enough to stand up and do anything about changing the society and helping people have a better society. So, He's willing just to go along to get along the status quo. He's not going to do anything to change now. Okay. So it says, nevertheless, Montag's appearance at his home gives him a tiny spark of hope. The fact that he actually came to Montag. Um, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. The fact that Montag actually came to him and that they're talking, you know, gave him a little bit of hope that there might be some change. Okay. Um, Um, unwilling not to act, Montag rips a, a page out of the Bible and another, then another, and, and until Faber agrees, until Faber agrees to help. So it's like ripping the book apart and Faber can't stand to see the book damaged. So he agrees to help. Faber promises to get in touch with an old friend. They're going to have a printing press and they're going, Faber even says, I'm going to help you deal with Captain Beatty. They're going to give Beatty a substitute Bible. Um, here we see technology but it's not the technology that you would think there, there's a two-way radio, uh, radio transmitter that Faber gives Montag that he's built so he can fit in someone's ear and so they can talk now I think that's pretty interesting because it's like the ear shells but also it's not unlike other things that we have today that you could just stick in your ear and you can talk to people so the technology um that's kind of cool that they had that. And I wonder if at this time, you know, if this is something that some kind of spy tools that they would have had, you know, back in the time period that this was written in. Um, I'm not sure, but it allows Faber to hear whatever Montag hears and to talk to Montag. And he's going to be able to talk to Montag to give him information. But Montag is still worried because he knows Captain Beatty is smart. He knows he's going to talk him out of the resolve. Um, and he knows that, I think at this point, he also knows that 
Beatty has some power over him. Um, often Faber and Beatty are set up as opposites, but I disagree with that. And let me tell you why I disagree with that. In the way that they both have knowledge and that Faber um, is weak and Beatty is strong, I can, I can recognize them as opposites. But other than that, Faber is a much weaker character than Beatty. And I see Montag and Beatty becoming set up as op more in terms of conflict and being, an op being opposites. But from the standpoint of strength and, and p strength and weakness and knowledge, they both have the same kind of knowledge. I can understand why. Um, yeah, I can, I can see why people do believe that they are opposites. Montag takes the subway home. Now remember, he still has the Bible. And Faber reads to him from the Bible because remember, Montag doesn't have a lot of experience reading. And they hear pleasant announcements that the country has mobilized for war because again, in a, in a dystopian society, the people in power have to have war. But the people in power pay for both sides of the war. They pay because war is a money maker. So, and it controls people and it keeps people scared. And what people want, what these people want is they just want society to be grateful that they've been protected. They can't give them any knowledge. They don't want them to have any knowledge that about what the war is about. They give them false information. And so they just want them to know there's a war, but we're protecting you. It's like parents taking care of little children and they don't want them to question. Here we have a contrast between Montag and Faber's reading of the Bible and the casual broadcast about the big war showing superficiality of the society. And when we talk about superficiality, we mean um, things that don't matter, things that uh, appear to be big. It's almost like fake news. If you think of superficiality, you can think of fake news and it's exactly the same thing about how wonderful um, these things are or oh my gosh did you hear about the kardashians this is what's going on with the kardashians again and so that's superficiality so at home as they come back home now in this scene we have mildred with all of her friends they're all there ready to watch the white clown and everybody's laughing um everybody is very um we could go back to previous story that we read remember when we read gadsby last year and remember Daisy and how Daisy was dressed in white. I always see Mildred dressed in white, much like Daisy, because with Mildred and Daisy, I see the absence of the absence of knowledge, the absence of responsibility, the absence of care. Mildred doesn't care about anything or anybody. She's just there. She's one of those people who want to suck in everything and give nothing back because she doesn't have anything. She doesn't have anything of value. So, Everyone arrives. Mrs. Phelps is there. Mrs. Bowles arrive. Um, Faber through Montag's earpiece says, don't do anything yet. Be patient because he's got people in his home. But Montag pulls the plug on the TV show. So the walls shut down and he tries to talk with them. Now, remember, these are women that are blank. They're only there to watch White Clown. They only want to see the show White Clown. And remember, this is an interactive kind of um, parlor walls when you say when you when you think of parlor you're you're talking about a living living room so your living room walls would be alive with tv screens and remember mildred when she woke up from committing trying to commit suicide if she did they only have three walls and she wants four she wants to be completely engulfed in her show and she wants to be completely part of of that environment because she doesn't want to live in the real world for her this is the real world so Montag is there and he's talking to them, pulls the plug and the women are confused at first. And then he doesn't even, they don't even understand what's going on. The women have no concern about the war, even though Mrs. Phelps says if her husband, um, and he's in the army, if he's killed, then she'll just probably marry again. And there, this shows their apathy, which I preach about all the time. Apathy meaning lack of care. So there's no She'll just begin. There's a disconnection from their family. There's uh, their decision to vote for president. President nobody nobody to look to nice. while the other candidate fat contact in the room. Everything is superficial. 
zero meaning, zero depth. They're just ridiculous. It's the these empty comments that mean absolutely nothing that that he's hearing and they enrage him. So Mildred and friends, all the society are completely lazy from Gatsby. People, Tom and Tom and Matthew, crash, crash, crash things up, crash things, and have no responsibility. They don't care about anything. There's no connection. That is correct. That is generated by society. That is the way the society has created a family unit because if they have no connections, they don't care about raising the next generation. If they don't care about politics and informed, they're not a danger. It's logical. Don't fight back. Just sit there and tell us, we'll tell you what to do. And then when it's time for us to take care of you, um, we'll do away with you because population control is a real thing. So Montag leaves the room in a rage, comes back. He's got the book of poetry. Faber's on his ear saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But Montag Said, mm, I got it. I'm going to do it. So he opens the book and he reads Dover Beach to Arnold. Dover Beach is a very emotional poem. And he reads this book to these women. And these women have never heard anything like this. And when he finishes, Miss Phelps is crying. Mrs. Bowles is almost angry. She doesn't like poetry. She denounces poetry in general. And she's mad at Montag for making them endure the messiness of poetry. Because remember, is information poetry is all about emotion. It's emotion. Monte even mentioned talking. Poetry was dangerous because if you tap the depth of emotion within these these people, from emotion comes a desire for more. They don't want the people to have emotion. Poetry is one of the dangerous books that they have. So urging, he says, get rid of that book. So he goes and drops it in the incinerator, but he gives Mrs. Bowl, Miss Bowles an earful before she leaves, listing all the sad things that's happened in her life. And she doesn't want to think about it. A friend of Mildred rushes to the bedroom, and rather than deal with it or even she takes the pills, Faber calls on to a fool, and Mom gets so angry, he just takes it out just a So what happened? When can handle here the poetry? Feeling them, they're angry. Time to be told something that they knew was true, or that you made them feel something that they knew was true. And rather than face that, they were angry with you. They wanted to argue with you. It was your fault that you made them feel this way. That's what happened. The question is this poem. It contains some kind of reality that they can like be inside. They've been holding the front. From they hide themselves with vision radio, they hide themselves through everything with the parlor people. So they want to hide their despair. The women leave by being angry, and that's how they're hiding it. But Mildred decides to take the sleeping pills, maybe go on, and maybe, maybe just, just to go. On. So Montag searches his house for books and he finds that Mildred has put them behind the refrigerator and he defines that she's burned them already. She wants rid of them because her life is changing and she doesn't want that. And she's angry at him. He hides the rest in the backyard. Um, and he leaves for work, feeling a little guilty at the time the women because he's not a bad guy. But then I think deep down he's kind of like, thought if they are right to care about only and be a pleasure trying to make up what's wrong. We're talking to Montag through the earpiece put back. Um, the fun is fine. There's peace. The world is on board. So, it's serious. You know, we're, we're in a war, so it's serious. Pay attention to that. That's something we see also. The manufactured wars of this society, not unlike the manufactured wars that we have. So there's a, a war in Ukraine with Russia, or is, we don't really know what's going on. We know what's being told to us. Um, I think a lot of us know that 
now after two years of what we've dealt with, we recognize that we don't know what we know. How do we know what we know? This is where Montag is waking up. Montag is saying, how do I know what I know? He's where we are in the same exact moment in time and space. Okay, so Montag is still wanting to protect the books above all else. He quit his job, and his job is to fire to burn books. So it's not entirely meant that what he's doing is really, really confused. He goes back to the firehouse, hands over the book to Bailey, comes back, tosses the waste basket without reading the title. It's a little interesting. All the firm play cards back inside contradictory packages from books and authors attempt to convince Monte that books are useless and untrustworthy. They are. Why does Beatty spend so much time memorizing those books? He clearly has a very intimate knowledge of what's going on. He spends a lot of time reading these books, and I dare say he has these books at his home. I would say he's read lots of them. But in a large and head into the night, at breakneck speed to the destination, and as you know, it's Montag's house. And in fact, it's difficult to believe that Beatty, who has submitted so many quotes and passages to memory, um, here is Beatty completely job as a fireman. What do you think? What do you think? Is he conflicted? Does he show that he's conflicted? Does he show that he uses this as power over other people? Do you think that he would want to save the book? What's more important to Beatty, the power or the knowledge? Or for him, does the knowledge ha bring him power? Something to think about. Without the books, how valuable would Beatty, or how strong would Beatty be? Okay, so that's the end of section two. Those are some questions I want you to think about. For section three, we're going to see what happens at the end of the story. But that's a quick overview of two, what happens. I've tried to explain it to you. If you have questions, please let me know. Um, there's so much still here we have to unpack. But this section is really important. Montag waking up. It's relevant to us because it sees censorship. It shows censorship here. It shows Faber as someone with knowledge. He knew what was going on. He watched society change, but he didn't need to do anything about it. So we have so many things that we can um, compare to our own society and questions you can ask yourself. If you were in Montag's position, what would you do? If you were Faber and you saw society changing, what side of history would you be on? And what about Beatty? What's really going on with Beatty? Does he really have the, this intimate knowledge of literature? What's, all, what's that all about? So until the next class, I want you to think about it. I hope you have enjoyed what we've talked about. And um, we will continue to talk about this. And if you have any questions, please, uh, please let me know. I definitely to know the questions because remember the questions that you ask yourself are always more important even than the answers because those are the things that you think so continue to finish i want you to make sure you finish three and then we'll uh, move on to the next sections but thank you so much i hope you enjoyed the lecture